This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. My guest today is Robert Courtley Gennaro. Robert is the Chief Strategy Officer at BitTru, uh, which is an advanced cryptocurrency management platform. Hey, welcome to the show, Rob. Good morning, Andy. How are you? I am very well, and a, a good morning to you, sir. Um, look, we'll do what we do at the beginning of the show, Rob. Uh, I'll invite you to please introduce yourself. Love to hear a little bit about your background. I can see you've got quite a substantial background in uh, investment banking, all that good stuff. So, uh, yeah, like to just hear some of that story uh, of, I guess, what you've been up to in the lead up uh, to getting uh, involved with the team at Bitru. Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I originally started off looking at economic policy and then I moved into investment banking. Uh, and then after that, I found myself in alternative investments, so asset management, hedge funds, and private equity advisory. I did that for a good number of years, I think six or eight years in the end, um, before going into consulting, um, sometimes for firms, sometimes for governments, uh, before then going to the London School of Economics to be a research fellow um, looking at well international finance in relation to Europe and how you attract investments into the Eurozone um, you know with a particular skew towards um, well ESG although that's got a bad title these days um, looking at that and then um, last year the opportunity came up to work with Be True which is based in Singapore um, and to be their chief strategy officer and guide them through the, well, idiosyncratic nature of our world, I guess. Um, and so it's been quite a varied ba- background and, and nature, but I guess that gives you the, uh, the ability to <laughs> look at lots of different issues, sometimes simultaneously. Absolutely. Like uh, it says in your bio, you know, you've uh, been working on different asset classes, investment styles, geographies and strategic and reputational challenges. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I like the sound of that. Uh, and it's it's be true, is it? Sorry, I, I think I called it bit true. It's just I, I'm just read. It's probably like a just a, a crypto way of reading it. But be true. Yeah, I think people use both. I, I call it be true. Some people call it bit true. Um, I think you're fine. I think you're safe with either. Um, right. don't, don't worry. Don't worry. Might just be uh, the old New Zealand accent as well, uh, Rob. <laughs> let's let's learn a bit about what Be True is then. So I've just been looking at the platform, and so for listeners, obviously the link will be in the show notes. Um, but it is simply uh, BeTrue.com, and well, we might as well spell it just for to avoid confusion. But B I T. Uh, ue.com so so be true yeah tell us uh, a little bit about the the platform rob so be true is a is a singaporean based cryptocurrency exchange cex and it's been was founded in 2018 and so it's been going all of that time and obviously you know as it has that's gone on the industry has changed and developed and had good years and bad years and where it finds itself today is we are on any given day between fifth and eighth in the world for spot trading. So the fifth largest for spot trading. And then around 10th to 15th for um, for derivatives trading, futures trading of cryptocurrencies. So, and in terms of a market, we have about 700 cryptocurrencies that we deal with, which is quite a lot larger um, than you'd find in Kraken or uh, Binance. And so, I think part of the rationale and reasoning for that is to support coins that are in their early development because you never know which ones are going to be, you know, you know, really going to gain traction and have a really good following. So, you know, the firm's view is that, you know, we'll bring more into the platform and then as time develops and say, right, this this hasn't gained any traction, your project isn't going anywhere, we'll delist you. Um, You know, there's a, there's a, you know, it's clearly a question around quality there, you know, what, you know, but you can't, you know, sometimes it takes a few years for something really, really good to develop. Um, but you know, as a as an exchange, you know, we're very close to you know, Ripple and XRP uh, and Cardano and ADA or IADA. 
Um, and and so, so those are two of the you know the two of the biggest base currencies that you know are used on the platform. In terms of where you know where we find ourselves today, this is partly my role, is looking at you know where we are going, how do we get there, um, how do we you know ensure that we're navigating the world that it is, and then you know where do we develop, you know, what what product services do we offer, um, which markets do we work in or not work in. Um, and some of those sort of more strategic questions, but at quite a granular level to think, well, you know, are we doing the right thing? What do we need to do more of? What do we need to do less of? Um, and, you know, we're sort of tasked with you know, proving what we do, but at the same time, thinking about, you know, how do you increase market share whilst at the same time not diluting what you do? Yeah. So, and it, it might sound silly, to think that but it, it is true you know, well if we if we become more prominent what do we lose what is the trade-off um and there's a few aspects of the business that you know we still need to to do so i mean there isn't currently p2p trading on on be true so that's one thing that we you know we need, we need to look at and you know, having and it's a legacy uh, issue that's not been on there i think you know you need a more frictionless approach uh for investors you know, they use the platform. So I think that's one of the things that's certainly on my mind. Um, so I hope that's given you some sense of what Betro is and what it does, uh, where we sit within the cryptocurrency uh, ecosystem. Um, yes. And yes. One thing I will go back to uh, is, is, is thinking, you know, I think it's important, people forget it sometimes, but the role of an exchange, any exchange, is to provide a market and sometimes to make a market where there's where a need to do so. Where it's advantageous to be, you know, proprietor. Yeah, well, that's I think right. beyond that, you know, people forget that. You know, I think in the wake of FTX last year and, and a few others, is that you know, people are, oh, you know, all consuming, all powerful, all knowing. Well, no, you know, we're no different in the sense of in any any exchange, whether it be commodities, equities. So, well, our role is to provide the market, ensure that you trade seamlessly, ensure that you you're trading securely, um, but it's up to the investor or the user or customer, however one wants to define the use platforms, to then say, well, this is what you have available. This is what we sell. There's good liquidity. And that's one of the things that, you know, it's important for us at all. What liquidity is in there? You know, how many people are there? How many people are buying? How many people are selling? Is it easy for you to get in and out of a trade? Those things are important. Um, you know, are we secure? But ultimately, it's going back to the bare bones of what we do. It's about providing a market. Yeah, that, look, it makes sense, Robin. I, I think that is um, a good argument as to why platforms such as uh, Be True are, as you pointed out, um, you know, open to listing all of these different um, token projects in the, let's say, you know, early stage of their potential business cycle because you know as you said you don't necessarily know uh which ones are going to uh prove to get eventual traction in the market or even achieve some kind of product market fit uh and as much as you know you know i was actually just looking on the on the be true um on your it's a, on the announcements page um, but it had, you have a coin listing section and it's amazing just some of the some of the names are you know this, <laughs> <laughs> age of gods space id a dgen zoo crypto gpt dog pad dog pad finance you know these are some of the more recent listings so yeah i mean i'm not sure how how long some of these will last but you do not know and as you've said the point of an exchange is not necessarily to pass too much judgment on these things, but to provide a market and give people the ability uh, to, well, make their views known uh, by by trading on, on these peers, right? Yeah, I think. That, I mean, Andy, if I if I go back to my investment banking momentarily, I think you know one of the things that you see with equity markets is when you know when there's a new. Uh, Initial public offering, you get a lot of information. You know, there are pitch decks. There's normally a pricing target for the open. Um, you know, you get a lot of information on the company's business model, its financials, its leadership, um, and that's not the case with initial coin offerings. You know, you don't get that so much. And I think there is a there is a need um, in my eyes for 
for there to be more information about projects. You know, where are they based? Who runs it? How how qualified are the team to lead this project? Um, you know, which you know, is it going to be on underneath a particular platform? So, is it being built on Ethereum? Is it being built on uh, XRP? You know, what, what is it being built on or not? Um, and what is the ultimate goal? And so, sometimes I think information can be scarce or not, you know, not um, given out in the way that would be really codified. It will be in you know Reddit groups. It will be in Telegram groups, more that group to discuss there rather than. Um, necessarily on us as an exchange. I think that's something that all exchanges can improve is the, is the quality of information that is available to people on a particular project. So I think that's one thing that needs to change. I think you know, if, because it is important, you know, we list a lot um, and I'm mindful of, you know, what that what that means. But you know, to, to your point, you're right. We, we, we don't know what will be successful and you can see Sometimes what you think will be successful, you're like, right, there's 200 people in this particular project. Um, they've got really good backing from you know, following number of VC firms or private equity firms. The, the people that run the firm, they come with physics backgrounds or whatever, you know, whatever their background is. And you think, okay, there's, a, there's an institutional um, level of quality to what this is trying to achieve. Whereas some projects, this, the information horizon is very scarce you know okay well tell me well, what differentiates this from something else why is it why is it more valuable where is it going to go and that's not always possible to do that and i think that's one thing that does need um yeah yeah i i uh, I, I agree there certainly um can be an information vacuum or an information asymmetry advantage or disadvantage depending on um on which side of the table you sit but i would argue rob that you know if the coin or the project is called dgen zoo i don't know anyway <laughs> we, we we won't judge by the names but um i one one thing that is um you know i don't know if it gives you pause but you know the kind of um the regulatory heat uh that is starting to ramp up uh really from the biden administration in the us and perhaps you know this has less effect on uh platforms such as be true which obviously you're based in singapore so you know perhaps you're um outside of uh, the us which is well a, a good thing if you if you want to list all these coins um but it does make it uh, just a little bit harder the more that you know the the different regulators around the world do try and clamp down on uh crypto and it's not just you know obscure tokens at the moment there you know the looks like uh the biden administration has a dim view of uh, not just, as I say, obscure tokens, but Ethereum and, and Bitcoin as well at the moment. Um, so interesting times uh, from a regulatory perspective, though, Rob. Yeah, I mean, if I, if I may, I'll take more of a global view rather than a particular country. Or, Please. You know, because I don't think it's fair to discuss, you know, any the one country or, no. um, you know, or particular business. And I think so I'll shy away from that. But. I think more broadly, you know, the industry is known or is aware, you know, following last year and following the year before that um, regulation was going to come in and or will come in. And, and that's important to say that, you know, in some countries and many countries, regulation is in development. It's going through policy stages. It's being developed. It's not there yet. It's being in, some, in some countries, that's different. But in, but in many, it's still being formulated decided what the policy will be um and i've spoken in the past and i guess i'll say it again now you know clearly there's some um regulatory need around uh wallet you know wallet storage and how how that works and how your asset, assets are protected um and does that constitute it just being the fiat component of a wallet or does it cover both the crypto and the fiat component so that's one thing to say um i think you're you know to a certain extent you know, you'll need some level of you know, regulatory equivalence. So you know, there's going to be some broad things that are going to be broadly applied wherever you are. Um, I think that's something for, you know, for exchanges to manage and, and look at. But in some senses, it's difficult for us as exchanges uh, to, to know what's going to be what until it comes out, right? So that's, that's, that's another thing to be, to be mindful of. Um, 
And I guess there's two routes, Andy, that's, you know, let's be clear. I mean, centralised exchanges like Be True, um, you know, are ones that do deal with regulators, do deal, um, they're institutionalised, right? Whereas you've obviously got decentralised exchanges, which are not. So, you know, I think it's important that regulators also understand that, you know, it's, there is an alternative. <laughs> The centralized exchange is already existing out there. And so the more um, the more onerous or tougher uh, you are with centralized exchanges, I guess the more you, it lends itself to then going to becoming decentralized. Um, so I think that's one thing I'm you know, mindful of or aware of and think that regulators should be aware of. But I think also looking back at the last year, you know, you can see why um, consumer protection is coming in um and and what that what that means you know and why why it's needed in some in frankly in some in some areas um but broader than that i think it's it's difficult because you're you're dealing at a country by country level um with slightly different desires you know in some countries it's about taxation in some some countries it's about consumer protection and in other countries it's um you know arguably an attempt to to protect traditional finance over DeFi. Yeah. So I think that there's, there's a number of different aims and objectives depending on which country you deal with. And I know, you know that the UAE recently, I said I wouldn't, wasn't going to pick on a particular country, but I have now, um, recently released some of its rules. And so it's broadly supportive of cryptocurrency exchanges and cryptocurrency in general, but it wants to see certain things and certain requirements. So I think, you know, you, you've got what the 200 countries in the world. Uh, some of them are very large markets for crypto. Some are very small. So it, it you know, it remains to be seen how all of those regulatory changes will develop on a country by country, or in, in, in the case of Europe, eurozone wide basis. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, if, and I'm also not a lawyer. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, but I mean, I think in my role, you know, commercially, I'm thinking, well, you know, it's, it's about risk mitigation, isn't it? Well, what, what are the risks? You know, what are the risks for us? You know, how important is it commercially? You know, there are certain markets. So, you know, the bulk of our business is Asia, Europe. Um, and so, you know, well, you know, regu regulatory issues in Europe um, or in Asia are more important to us commercially than they are in sub Saharan Africa. You know? So, you have to also weigh up how commercially imperative it is for you to be compliant with you know what's going on in a certain in a certain country and whether indeed you should you continue on in a certain market or not based on what you know to be the regulatory environment once it's been established well, what are the most important or the largest shall we say markets for for be true then uh rob based in singapore where uh where are the, most of the the users coming from are they distributed across the world i guess it is global, although it, it is, you know, we don't deal, um, I think like 90%, and I don't have, the, I don't have a pie chart with me, 90% um, of, our, of our business is done in Asia and Europe. So yep. across those two countries are very important. And then you've got, and obviously it can change day to day. I and mean, that's another thing to say, you know, it's not, a, it's not a stagnant, you know, fixed number. It does change on a you know, daily, weekly, monthly basis. Um, depending on what people what people want, um, so I mean we're you know if you look at it from a from a broad, not just an us sense but a, a broader sense you know we're we're basically the same as much as the the sector you know so it's Asia Europe there's a couple of countries in Africa that are very prominent so Nigeria you know has a lot of crypto trading and there are reasons for that um, you know at, at a local level there's a lot of distrust I think around. Nigerian economy, um, the Nigerian government. I'm not bashing the Nigerian government. I'm just looking at, you know, trying to get into the psyche of why people use crypto in that particular market. Um, so I'm hoping that sort of gives you a sense. But I mean, Asia, Asia and Europe are our predominant focus. Yep, makes sense. All right. Well, you know, Rob, you come from a um I suppose traditional uh banking background or investment banking legacy finance if, if you like is one way of describing it um get curious as on on your thoughts in terms of you know what 
what perhaps uh, the two different industries can learn from each other if we if we think of TradFi uh, and, and crypto. A um, little bit in common, a lot that's not in common, and a lot of misunderstandings between the two industries as well. Yeah, so, I mean, I think what I found probably more useful is, is sort of drawing upon the, the work I've done in the past, pedicons and asset management firms, and, and seeing crypto as an alternative investment class, um, and how that you know how that plays out. Why we're I mean, looking at the reasons why people buy crypto or don't, looking at its adoption, adoption rates, and I think you know one of the barriers to it, you know, a bit like some hedge fund strategies, if I may, lend from them, is that sometimes it, you know crypto can be overly complicated. Um, for people to understand, and that's, that's inherent in some of the technology and some of the approaches. But what it makes is it, it makes it less accessible to retail investors. Um, and so I think that's something to, to, to bear in mind. And you, know, you, you get that you know, the same way in asset management firms or hedge funds that are playing particular strategies. They can be quite exotic. You know, you might have event-driven emerging market strategy in in credit in, in crikey okay so you're buying the distressed assets of companies you know, in emerging markets that people have probably never heard of right and then you're like trying to make people aware of um you know what's going on in that particular company so i think you know it, it, that's it can be quite useful having in both sides um because you can see what what works well and what what doesn't work well in terms of what can be learned i think you know there's there's clearly a, there's clearly a uh, both a passion and a need for decentralized finance, and I guess it's more a case of how it marries or doesn't um, with traditional finance and how they work together, or don't. <laughs> um, it's not for me to decide, Andy. You know what, whether they do or don't. I think it, what it's important to say is that you know, there is the opportunity um, for for both sides to work together um, if people want it. You know, that's another thing to say. And, and from traditional finance, you've seen, you know, statements from uh, Citibank, Goldman Sachs, BP Morgan and others saying that we want to have, um, you know, we're interested in digital assets, how they work, and we want to create products, you know, for, for that, for that market. And I think, you know, for, for decentralized finance, I think it's, you know, it's also important to remember that, you know, crypto is a, cryptocurrencies are around a 1.1, 1.2 trillion market cap at present it's been higher than that it's been lower than that um so it's fairly you know it's large but it's still equally quite small it's you know half the size of the italian economy to give you an example you know the example of what it is on a sort of gdp basis so you know that will change over time that will develop over time and i think it's interesting going back to your question around where do people buy be true from um you know, there are two there are two uh scenarios that people typically you know get involved with crypto the first is around um you know high disposable income high highly developed economies um and the second is where there is no trust <laughs> in the local economy so you know typically emerging markets um or innovative emerging markets where you find that there's there's interest in not just relying being reliant or uh you know having greater access to not just your your national fiat currency um you know because of the risks involved in holding it so in that sense you know crypto can work as a very very successful very good store of value but equally one that does move against the value of other cryptocurrencies yes indeed uh yes. Very <laughs> Very well said. And look, I wonder, uh, Rob, with your um, chief strategy officer hat on, you know, what um, perhaps you can give us uh, a sense of what's coming down the pipe, uh, maybe like product wise at, at BitTru or, yeah, what, what are you guys working on? And I can see that you actually do have uh, quite a large and wide ranging product suite already. Um, you know, you talked about the the spot trading, but there's also um, 
yeah, various uh, derivatives offering. There's an earn platform with staking and crypto backed loans and so on. So there's a lot going on on the Beetroot uh, platform already, but um, I'm sure you're always looking to try and innovate and try and stay ahead. We, we do our best, um, but there are, you know, I think there's a number of things, you know, so there's, there's two elements to that, Andy, to your question, as I see it. You know, the first is around um, you know, market, market driven needs. So what yeah. do people want from us? And I think, you know, the, crit- the critical ones that we've, you know, not had in P2P trading um, and more frictionless, you know, on and off ramping uh, to be true. You know, I think that's, the, that's a pain point that I'm deeply aware of. Um, and I think you know, it's something that the company needs to remove. Um, so I think that's that's one. I think broader than that, there's there's clearly uh, an opportunity to you know, have digital asset management, uh, digital wealth management, and a component of that, and how you look at that. And then there's you know, be true, just very little with institutional investors. So much of what we do is retail. And so there's an opportunity for us to do more. And what I mean by institutional investors, and I mean, you'll know this, and I'm sure your listeners do too, but just to, you know, so we're clear, is um, you know, wealth management firms, asset management firms, hedge funds, uh, maybe some banks that want to buy and hold crypto and how you can, can work with them to provide a market because they're big institutional buyers. So that's something that you know, we're also aware of. And then I think the, the last thing is, is looking at, you know, how things develop, you know, what develops around us and where do the opportunities present themselves to, to provide that. So there is a, Beetroot has a Ventures, um, Beetroot Ventures is what it's called, ironically. Um, and that has a sort of, a, his task with finding what will be the future uh, of Web 3.0 and investing in it. And so I think that's got six or eight active investments at present um, and has around 50 million in the fund. It might be more than that actually now. Um, last time I checked, it was 50 million um, in the fund looking at uh, new companies, effectively VC, VC backing for companies that are going to do well, but they're always normally, co- they're normally co-investments. Um, so we've done a couple, I think we've done one with Cardano, we've done one with, with Ripple. So you know, it's not things that we just do by ourselves. Um, but I think if I, if, I, if I may, you know, going back to the market need is that this market is changing. <laughs> and what I mean by that is I think you'll see over time, um, you know, few, fewer cryptocurrencies, um, but a greater following for those that, that, those that, those that are. Uh, and I think it will really depend on the nature of the way that three, nature, Web 3.0 or Web 3 develops. Um, you know, once you once that's become more uh, more developed and has a greater a greater ecosystem, I think you, you you're going to see you know, where the digital asset opportunities really lie and, and where its future will go. And again, that is not for me to dictate what any one individual to dictate. Um, but I think you know, once you see that, you'll get a greater sense of where trade finance will work and won't work within that. Um, and and how we develop over time. So I've given you quite a rambling answer, but hopefully hopefully it's made some sense. Yes, indeed. And I, I suppose just on that, um, Rob, as we start to finish off, I, I suppose it would be maybe maybe good just to to get uh, your comments on yeah how how you see a crypto and the kind of the the broader macro market at the moment. Um, look, speculation, obviously, and it's it's a it's a it's a turbulent time in the world. There's lots going on. Uh, we seem to be experiencing exponential runaway AI um, in, in, in the background. Um, meanwhile, could be a banking crisis unfolding in the US, but yeah, but perhaps not. Um, and early early signs of a, a kind of a, a thaw in, in the crypto bear market as well but um well those those are just my my kind of bullet point notes but um yeah curious to hear yours yeah i mean it's, it can be quite a headache at times if you're looking at it from a you know from a strategic point of view thinking well how do we navigate this this global environment and what it means and if you, you know, standing back from it sometimes 
Um, and looking at the issues, you're right. You know, there is a potential banking crisis. Is that as bad as 2008? I don't think it will be because it's not, you know, not so mortgage backed. It's more debt backed. It's U.S. Treasury backed, and, and the issues around that. Um, but you've seen banks be exposed. You know, I don't need to really go into that. It's been all that <laughs> it's been all that there is has been in the news in the last few weeks. But it's a very mixed picture. You know, you've got some countries that are doing really well. Australia, because of commodities doing really really well um europe's fairly slow you know its, its growth is slow you know, the uk economy is slow um the us economy you know for the most part seems to be doing pretty well you know lots of its employment is really high um sorry its unemployment is low employment is really high but then you've got inflation raging inflation going everywhere and you've got central banks reacting to that you know you don't need to read the financial pages we, we all feel that when we go shopping we're all seeing it you know the cost of Loans has gone up, the cost of debt has gone up, um, and that's a challenge. And I think you've got the, the big the big economies of, of our world, you know, the, the Eurozone, the UK, uh, the US, Canada, and Japan are all, you know, obviously China too, um, have you know question marks over where they're going and why. And it's really like I looking back and with my sort of economic trading hat on for a moment, you know, it's a very difficult picture, Andy, to to, to look at and establish, you know, where are we going? What is the good? What is the bad? It really is difficult. Um, yeah, and if you if you look at equity markets as opposed to current crypto, I'll come on to crypto in a second. Um, you know, the the price to book uh, values are around four. You know, they were as high as five. You know, but you, then you see, you know, certain companies like picking on FTX or Credit Suisse at the moment. You know, the the value, the book value, often is. It's purely goodwill, you know. It's it's just the name, it's the brand, uh, and once that's deteriorated and gone, actually, <laughs> the value isn't there. Um, you know, price to earnings have been very high. I think they're, for the S and P, they're around nineteen twenty. So you know, it'll take you twenty years of earnings to get back what you paid for an S for the S and P index. It's a long time. It's a long time for a payback. Um, you know, at the same time, the the Bonds are becoming uh, more attractive to hold because the yield is higher. Um, so it's a very mixed picture for crypto. You know, moving into the crypto space, you know, there's a lot of unease, which is partly driving the market. You know, people moving into um, to, to Bitcoin for that reason and Ethereum for that reason. But then you've also got, in Ethereum's case, you also have uh, its upcoming changes. Uh, so that is driving it. You know, there are uh, again, not trying to discuss a legal case, but you know, there's been market moves towards XRP in the last few days. Um, so you know, you've got project specific and then market wide um, factors that are driving uh, the cryptocurrency market, which is really interesting. But it makes it quite granular. Uh, you know, it's not all driven. Some of it's a big, you know, some of it's a sell off, some of it's going up. And you know, there are reasons for that. And looking at Bitcoin in the last few days, it's obviously been down. Um, but the, you know, some of the reasons for that are tied to, you know, a particular exchange having some issues, um, in, you know, last week. And so that feels probably a little bit um, premature to have sold off for the, for the reasons that people have. So I, I, I've realized I've been quite sweeping there across the globe and across different asset classes. But I think my, my, my final point would be that it, you know, it is quite a mixed picture for people and it's quite difficult. Um, you know, you'll see pockets of you know, good economic outcomes and, and some pockets of bad. I think the, the biggest risk, if I to, you know, to go to a microeconomic level for a moment, I'm sorry to bore you, Andy, is, is you know, how it affects real people, you know, the, the cost of, the cost of borrowing, the cost of living. You know, frankly, if if people cannot afford to live, if people cannot afford to pay their mortgages, um, or their or their credit card debts, or whatever they've got, or car loans, then then frankly, or if there's no capital around for you know for emerging for emerging business ideas, then you're going to have a big economic decline. Um, you know that's very basic economics, but it's true. And so the you know ever increasingly, uh, the, the the higher the cost. Of borrowing, the higher the cost of existing debt, the harder it becomes um, for, for for real people to live. Yes, well, look, very well said, uh, Rob. Uh, so thank you for sharing your thoughts. Then, 
Um, I think, you know, there's there's not much else to say really, except um, start to, to wrap up. And I, I would invite you to do so by, you know, telling people uh, where they should go uh, to learn more really about the Be True platform if, if they're not familiar and make the case uh, for, yeah, why they should. So you can access uh, Be True on betrue.com and then we have the Be True official Twitter page, uh, which you can access. We do a number of uh, Twitter space AMAs there with interesting projects uh, across different times. They're normally weekly, so that's one thing for you to have a look at. Um, and then I think just you know, more broadly, have a you know have a look and see what we do we you know to andy's point you know we do do a lot uh we've become you know one of the world's largest exchanges there are reasons for that go and explore it go and have a look we also have a medium channel so we you know our channels are quite uh quite narrow uh but i think that's important for us it means we can control um how we interact with you know with the users and customers that we have so you know go and have a look and andy i think you know as a final point from my side thank you for, very much for having me uh, it's been really good to talk to you today and um, you know, all the best. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, and all the best to you as well. Um, I'm sure we'll do this again sometime. But yeah, as I always say, all the best and bye for now. All right, there you go. That was Rob from uh, Be True. Uh, yeah, fascinating. I'm not uh, super familiar with Be True or certainly wasn't before having uh, Rob on. So always good to learn about uh, all the different exchanges uh, that are operating around the world. Uh, Be True, of course, bigger in the Asian markets. Um, but yeah, how good was Rob? Nice guy. I enjoyed that. Thank you for coming on, Rob. Thank you to you, the listeners, for listening. Even here at the end of the show, please make sure you are subscribed to the Crypto Conversation in whatever podcast app you are using. But that is today's show, team. Thank you for listening. And bye for now. This was the Crypto Conversation for Brave New Coin. See you.